Welcome, friends, to a brand new year. Uh, I, I delayed this video by a little bit. Usually I record this right at, like, the start of the year. I, I think last year I even recorded my my movies of 2021 on, on New Year's Day. That's when I recorded the video. Um, but this year I, I didn't quite get around to all of the movies I wanted to in time. Even now, I have still not seen Avatar 2 and Bullet Train, two movies I did want to watch, just did not have time for. But I, I ran a poll asking if you guys wanted to see me talk about more movies or if you wanted this video sooner, and pretty overwhelmingly people wanted me to talk about more movies, so uh, it's Oscars weekend. Here's my movies of 2022, all, all the movies I saw in 2022. And, uh, look at this. I'm, I'm at a new place. I know it's the exact same table in the exact same, uh, uh, shelves that you're used to seeing, but trust me, this is a new apartment. Maybe you can tell the acoustics are different. The acoustics are kind of shit right here. I apologize for that. Echo! But, I mean, maybe you can tell I've, like, rearranged the shelf a little. Um, I've, I've moved the, uh, Vinegar Syndrome shelf up here over this shoulder, so there's all my, not all of my Vinegar Syndrome movies, just the Vinegar Syndrome movies I own that I haven't watched yet. <laughs> um, the Video Nasty shelf, this has gone from my bad movie shelf to my Matt's Fun Time Weird Movie shelf. These are all movies I have reviewed on the show, and I've got my Cool Cat book over here. I've also got this very nice copy of Miami Connection, which I actually have not reviewed, but it's one of my favorite movies, so I, I, I gotta have it there. I gotta have it on display. And then, you know, MST3K shelf, my regular collection is all still here. I am also going to take this opportunity to drink a whole bunch of weird sodas. I complained about a year and a half ago that, uh... I, I was, like, running out of weird sodas. That is no longer the case. I have accrued weird sodas faster than I have been able to drink them in videos, at least. Um, so... I, I will be drinking a variety of weird sodas throughout this video, starting with this Nitro Pepsi, which I believe you were supposed to put in a glass. That's what the instructions on the back say. So I am going to pour myself a glass of Pepsi Nitro. Look at that. <laughs> Once again, I have to ask, Pepsi, you do know you're not a beer company, right? That's pretty damn good. Um, it's a little flat because I've had it sitting there a while, but it's also like nitro boosted, so that helps. That helps it not quite be as flat. Anyways, we are going to go through these movies from uh, uh, worst to best, as is tradition. Although, uh, this first movie we're going to talk about, it's, it's the rare instance where a movie is so good that it transcends being at the top of the list and has to move back to being at the bottom of the list. I am talking, of course, about Morbius. Uh, the greatest movie ever released, ever. Now, unfortunately, I am not a true Morber. I have broken the one sacred rule of the Morbius fandom. Never watch the movie. And, uh, that's very good advice, I think. Morbius is the greatest movie ever made, as long as you never watch it. You just have to have faith. Have faith. Faith that Morbius is the greatest movie ever made, and it forever will be. Unfortunately, once you watch it, the illusion's kind of broken, and you find out that it's a pretty mediocre movie. I didn't think it was, like, awful. I've certainly seen worse comic book movies. I've seen worse Marvel movies. But, uh, it's pretty fucking bad. Um, and also a lot of it is forgettable, like, it's, it's been a little while since I've seen this, 
and the only parts that really stand out to me are like, first off, first off, the special effects in this movie are actually really good. Like, that's not... <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing the Morbius meme right here. The special effects in Morbius are actually pretty good. It's got good effects. I remember a handful of, like, particularly stupid scenes. But the thing that sticks out in my mind the most is that at the end, they kind of set up, like... I don't know, it's it's like the 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 universe swapping thing from from no way home except they've weirdly used it to put uh uh michael keaton's birdman into the morbius universe his name is falcon he's not birdman but he's birdman they've, they've put michael keaton's more uh, michael keaton's falcon into the morbius universe for some fucking reason that does I mean I don't have high hopes for Morbius getting a sequel. There sh there's probably not going to be a second Morbius movie cuz this movie bombed twice. Like come on, man. I have my doubts there will ever be a second Morbius movie, but uh if they ever do make a Morbius movie, Michael Keaton's Falcon from Spider-Man Homecoming might be in it. For, for very weird, very strange reasons. Uh, I'm not gonna dwell on Morbius. Uh, you know everything about Morbius you need to know by now already, probably. So let's just move on. A Christmas Story Christmas. A, another movie I'm not gonna dwell on very long. Because I talked about this one when I drunk ranked the entire Christmas Story franchise. And, um... It ranked higher on that list than this list. There were there were two movies below it on that list, where on this list it's second to last. So I, I think that says something about the absolute quality of A Christmas Story 2 and Ollie Hop Noodle's Haven of Bliss. That this movie that I consider one of the worst of the year would be ranked above those two. I don't think A Christmas Story Christmas is like horrible or anything. Uh, I believe in that video I said it was a nothing movie. And really, going through those Christmas Story movies helped me sort out the difference between, like, an obnoxiously boring movie and a nothing movie, right? Ollie Hop Noodle's Haven of Bliss? Obnoxiously boring. Like, it hurts me how boring Ollie Hop Noodle's Haven of Bliss is. A Christmas Story Christmas? It's just kind of nothing. Right, it's a movie that's on, and you take nothing away from it. It just runs right through you. It's like, yep, you sure did hit a lot of the beats of a Christmas story, I guess. Good, good, good work on that, I guess. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's time to move past this, like, oh, bringing back a franchise thirty, forty years later with with the characters old now, and they have to deal with the fact that they're old now. I'm going to contradict that in a second when I compliment a movie with basically that premise, but uh, in Christmas Story's case, not nah, didn't need to happen. Studio 666. This is a film uh, from the Foo Fighters. It stars the Foo Fighters. It's about the Foo Fighters going out to this, like, haunted cabin and writing trying to write an album and then uh, horror shit happens it's it is the most basic premise for like a rock movie i i have ever saw rock and roll horror movie i have ever seen like maybe i'm just saying that because i've been doing metal ween for so long but this has the exact same plot as like every fucking movie i review for metal ween and, and you know mr dave grohl very talented performer i mean he's, he's even been in movies where i think he's good i think it's very funny that he's the devil in uh tenacious d in the pick of destiny he cannot act in this movie his acting is Awful. He does a really bad job in this movie. John Carpenter's in this movie. In fact, John Carpenter did the score for this movie. Uh, does not help. Does not save things. Uh, 
it's just it, this 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 was my biggest disappointment of the year because I thought this would at least be like fun. It would at least be like over the top and silly and gratuitous. And no, no, this movie's like pretty dull uh, and uh, pretty unenjoyable. The acting is bad. The writing is bad. Uh, most of it is bad. The kills are not like cool enough. To justify how bad everything else is. And they're also, like, kind of poorly paced. Uh, like, I, I, I could use a little more violence in this movie, you know? Speaking of horror movies where the kills are not good enough to justify how bad everything else is, up next is A24's Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. I was not into this movie. I did not enjoy this movie. The characters are so... Fucking annoying. And, like, you can have an annoying character in your horror movies. Maybe even, like, two or three. As long as their deaths are really cool and really gratuitous. None of the kills in this movie are fun. There are no fun kills in this movie. Most of the time, you don't even see the kill happen. You, they just find the body and... After it's been killed. And it's like... That's so lame. That's so lame. And the characters are so fucking obnoxious. Oh my god, these characters are obnoxious. It, it seems like they're maybe trying to do some sort of, like... Satire on, like, millennial culture. Like, extremely online people. And they, they, they recite just, like, a bunch of, like... Very dull, very meaningless, like, like, like over, over, you not meaningless, but when they say them, it's meaningless because they're just regurgitating something they heard online. Like, there's a lot of, like, ooh, you're gaslighting and you're so toxic and you're this and that. And it's, it's very annoying. It's very annoying the way they do it. The characters are very annoying and the kills are not fun. It's, it's a grading experience, and I, I did not enjoy it. Especially, especially in a year when A24 put out two much better slasher movies. So, jumping from the movies I think are bad to the movies I think are pretty okay, up next we've got Rob Zombie's The Monsters, and... Boy, does Rob Zombie love his wife. That is the nicest thing I can say about this movie. Rob Zombie really does love his wife. Uh, there's stuff I enjoy about the monsters. There are funny jokes here and there in the monsters. Honestly, it's it's the type of script that, like, 15 years ago would have been a big-budget studio comedy, but now it's kind of a cheap-looking, straight-to-Netflix movie. And that's not to, like, disparage the sets. I, I mean, it is a nice-looking movie. They, they did go out of their way to make a... a a movie that looks very is, is very aesthetically true to the monsters. Really, the biggest problem I have with this movie is that it's so all over the place. Like, like at about like the hour fifteen mark, they move to America. They move from Transylvania to America into like the classic monster house, and at that point, pretty much anything that was set up before that is just dropped. There is one character that comes back after that. There's like a werewolf from the beginning of the movie. It's, it's, I think Lily's sister, or Lily's brother is the werewolf. Uh, it, it is Lily, right? Lily's not the Adams. Yes, yes, no, it's Morticia Adams, Lily Monster. Uh, Lily's brother comes back at the end, and he's the only character from the first half of the movie that we see again. Like, there's this mad scientist character, don't see him again. Uh, Elvira is in there as, like, this villain. We don't see her again. It just, it feels like the last 20 minutes of this film are completely disconnected from the first hour 15. And... Even the first hour 15 is not, like, the most coherent. It's a little all over the place, but you could, like, bring it together by the end. And this film just kind of doesn't. It's just kind of like, 
here's all these little ideas we have for this movie, and okay, here's the the prequel to the monsters. Like, right at the very end, this is how the monsters got their house. The end. But I mean, it's like... It's like a fun thing to throw on at, like, a Halloween party when no one's gonna be paying attention to it anyway. You just want to have, like, something spooky on the screen that, like, any time you look over, it's like, Oh, hey, look, something funny is happening on the screen. But, like, if you really just sit down and pay attention to the whole film, it doesn't really work as, like, a cohesive product. But it's a good thing to just, like, throw on the TV at, like, a Halloween party. Down the hatch. Alright, this one's interesting. This is Mountain Dew Overdrive. This is a flavor of Mountain Dew that is exclusive to a, a chain of gas stations that only exist in Central America. Right, there were like a few in Oklahoma, there were a bunch in Kansas, there were a bunch in Nebraska. I think we even stopped at one in Iowa. Although, there's like, fuck and shit in Iowa. There is absolutely nothing in Iowa. There is snow and windmills, that is the whole state. But, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the gas station. I think it was Casey's? Casey's, uh, is, is the name of the gas station that this is the exclusive flavor at. Just to clarify, I was driving through these states because I drove from Texas to Wisconsin. In case I didn't make that clear earlier, the new place all the way in Wisconsin, not not in Texas anymore. <laughs> I was worried because like, you know, like at my old place, they loved to mow right outside my window while I was recording shit. I was worried they were gonna come by with the snow plow, but I was gonna let them because like, nah, fuck it, man, plow that snow. You, you, you are allowed to make as much noise as you want. But it looks like they got done about the time I started recording, which is very nice. Anyways, let's give uh, Mountain Dew Overdrive, exclusive to Casey's Gas Station, a try. I feel like I have had a Mountain Dew flavor that was like this. Like a strawberry citrus blast flavor. I don't know. I think this is sort of fruit punch is the idea. This is like fruit punch Mountain Dew. It is an appropriate color because the next movie on this list is Turning Red. Uh, the new Pixar movie. I did not see Lightyear. Fuck Lightyear. I don't even want to count Lightyear as a Pixar movie. That feels like... That feels like something Pixar was forced into making by Disney... Turning Red feels like the movie they actually wanted to make this year. Now, my dear partner Mitzi, who is here, uh, they're in the other room. I wonder if I should get them and ask them if they want to talk about Turning Red, because they actually loved this movie. They really enjoyed this movie. I did not so much. Uh, I, I compared it to Bo Burnham's 8th grade. It's, it's Pixar's Bo Burnham's 8th grade. And I, I have the same problem with this as I have with 8th grade, which is just that, like, yeah, really accurate portrayal of those awkward middle school years. I don't want to be reminded of the awkward middle school years. I did not enjoy my awkward middle school years. That was a bad time. Please don't remind me. And listen, maybe if you're going through it. If you are currently an awkward middle school student, maybe you'll enjoy this. Or, you know, obviously like, Mitzi enjoyed it. Lots of people seem to have liked this one. I, I clearly am, like, I'm sort of the outlier for saying I don't like it. And even then, like, I enjoy it. There's a lot about this movie I like. I think it's very well animated. I love, like, the big musical stuff at the end. Uh, it's, it's a good movie. It's a fun movie. But, uh, I just, I don't enjoy being reminded of my awkward teenage years. I also feel like, in, in terms of, like, the, the story, in terms of, like, what the film is about, ultimately, it hits a lot of the same beats as Encanto, and I enjoyed Encanto a lot more. Are you inviting me to join your video? Yeah, you want to come talk about Turning Red? Okay. I don't look that great anyway. I haven't, like, cleaned myself today. 
So now I'm in your video. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Welcome aboard. <laughs> what What did you like about Turning Red? Um. Well, I like it because it's like a very honest movie. You don't get a lot of movies that are like honest about the teenage girl experience. A lot of them are like, either they're like way older, way more mature than they actually are, or it's like, oh. <laughs> don't cover your face while you're talking. <laughs> don't. Fine. <laughs> Fine, I won't. It just feels very real, and I don't think you get a lot of that. And also... I think I like how uncomfortable it makes a lot of people because, you, I, again, you need that honesty. You need that realism. And girls don't get to be, like, silly and weird and awkward and kind of, you know, just gross and odd all the time. Like, you get a lot of, like, you get a lot of that with, like, male characters. You don't get a lot of that with, like, female characters. You know what I mean? Like, you don't get to be awkward and weird and and all of that kind of stuff and so this is a very honest movie about that and it's just very relatable and it it feels real so i i guess that's why i like it a lot also the music i like the music in this movie it's very fun it's good music i like the music in this movie too <laughs> um, but uh it didn't mention 9 11 so zero out of ten <laughs> zero out of ten <laughs> all right thank you okay you're welcome all right, uh, there's there's the alternate perspective. Someone who did enjoy the film. I mean, I enjoyed the film. I liked the film. I just, I didn't love it. I think I think Mitzi likes it a lot more than I do. But um, like I was saying, I, I think it hits a lot of the same beats Encanto did, and I just liked Encanto a lot more. <laughs> you want to talk about, like, the, the family drama, the, the generational trauma. It's, I think Encanto did it better than Turning Red. Um, maybe that's unfair. You can have more than one movie about that, but just for me personally, if, if I'm going to watch one of these movies again, it's going to be Encanto. Encanto's just it's like the much better movie. I was surprised at how much I liked Encanto. That's, that's part of why I waited this year. Cause I watched Encanto like two days after I did my 2021 video. And I'm like, man, that was like a surprise for me. Cause I don't, typically like Disney movies that much, but in Encanto hit. Encanto was a good one. So I, I, I was a little disappointed I didn't get to talk about Encanto in, la in last year's video. So that's part of why I sort of held off this year until I could watch more movies. Cut this out. <laughs> no, I'm leaving this whole conversation where we're a thousand feet from the microphone in the video. Okay. Speaking of awkward grade school comedy is this one's high school not middle school but uh just above that we've got metal lords uh this is starring jacob trimbley and some other people i talked about this in my 11 more metal movies video but i gave it pretty low ranking on that video because i don't like it's a fun movie there's stuff i like about it much like uh turning red killer soundtrack love the music in this movie uh s some like genuinely good deep cuts in there um and you know there's some like very funny cameos throughout the film and then there, there, there is stuff i like about it there is stuff i like about it i like uh that that uh, uh th this like amazing guitarist that this kid looks up to ends up being like the guy in charge of like the the home for like a what, what is it like a, a like a children's mental facility not children's like adolescent juvenile detention center not detention center it's like I don't know. It's it's a hospital for kids. It's a hospital for kids with, like, social issues. But, uh, yeah, there was, there was a lot I enjoyed about this movie. But ultimately, it's, like, a pretty predictable high school comedy. You kind of know what's going on. I don't know that I have much else to say about Metal Lords. It's, it's sort of like Deathgasm if the zombies never showed up. This is, like... The, the family-friendly version of Deathgasm. And, I mean, it's still, like, kind of filthy. Like, they do swear a lot. The band, the name of the band in the movie is Skullfucker. 
But it's a much more family-friendly movie than Deathgasm. It is Deathgasm that you can show your parents. Like, I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta find things to say other than moving on. I say moving on way too much when I'm in these videos. Top Gun Maverick. The first of, like, probably quite a few on the- although maybe Turning Red was the first. The first of quite a few movies on this list where I'm like, I liked this, I do not love it as much as everyone else seems to love it. Weirdly, like, I kinda shit-talked this movie at the end of my Most Pointless Movies of 2021 video, because I'm like, oh god, they're making a fucking Top Gun sequel? Why? But, uh, th then it comes out and everyone's like, oh, this movie's so good. This is such a good Top Gun movie. And I'm like, wait, really? <laughs> and I watched it, and I think I probably do like it better than the first Top Gun, because I was not... I'm not big on the first Top Gun. I get its cultural impact, and I think there are some fun moments in that movie. But ultimately, I don't, like, love Top Gun. I think I liked this one a little better than the first Top Gun, but it, uh, by and large, it kind of feels like the same movie. And I, I don't even mean that in, like, a negative way. I, I'm not saying it's just a rehash of the first film. I'm just saying, like, in general, I feel very much about this film like I do about Top Gun. It's like, yep, yeah, that that's... You, you sure did Top Gun <laughs> right there. Like, the flying segments are, like, the most fun, interesting part. And then the, the plot of the movie is, like, eh... The only really fun parts outside of the flying are just seeing Tom Cruise being full of himself. But I mean, goddamn, those flying segments, they, they were good. They were well shot, they were well made. Very good movie. Uh, very, very good action in this movie. Now, this is the rare instance where I think waiting as long as they did to make the sequel kind of worked out for them. Like, my, my biggest issue with this was it's, like, one of those 30, 40 years later sequels that's just about the main character of the last film dealing with being old. But in Top Gun's case, that kind of works. I think if you had made a Top Gun sequel, like, right after Top Gun had come out, it would not be as good as Top... It would not be as good as Top Gun Maverick, at least. Um... I, I think it would be kind of a dull rehash, where this, I think, manages to pull itself out of just being a dull rehash by sort of addressing how much time has passed and sort of, you know, de dealing with, like, oh, what would Maverick be like after all these years? What, what does old Maverick look like? Now, I think the reason people have gravitated towards this film so much, why people love this film so much, is it's different. Now, not that different. This is just kind of what movies were like back in the 80s when Top Gun came out. But in our modern blockbuster landscape, this is not like anything else that is coming out. I think people are just desperate for an action movie that is different, that shakes up the status quo in any sort of way, that is not just another dull Marvel movie, uh, and Top Gun Maverick delivers. It delivers a movie from the 80s, it delivers a movie I have seen dozens of times, but to the modern eye, it certainly stands out. It is certainly different than uh, a lot of films being released nowadays. Yeah, Top Gun Maverick, like, props for what it does right, but I, I didn't, I didn't, like, love it. I think, I think if they were a little better with, like, the actual story of the movie, I could give it a little more credit, because like I said, the action scenes, fucking phenomenal. Great action in this movie. I'm, I'm very happy with the action. The story story kind of drags it out. And also, it's it's probably about 20 minutes longer than it needs to be. I, I, I was watching it, and I'm like, okay, yeah, we're wrapping it up. Oh, wait, no, no, there's a whole extra thing about, like, Maverick and, and Goose's son Rooster being stuck out wherever the fuck. 
spoilers kind of it's, it's it seems it seems really obvious it does hit a lot of the beats you expect it to hit but um i mean it was good i like how they implemented val kilmer in this movie i i like that they've sort of because val kilmer of course famously he's lost his tongue to throat cancer he can't really talk as well as he used to so a lot of his character's dialogue in this movie is via text, but they do have this one moment where he like turns to Maverick and says something to him and like you know, it's Val Kilmer, he's straining to talk, but it's it's like a really uh, like kind of it's kind of a powerful moment in the movie when you get to see Val Kilmer just say something to Maverick and it's like I love you, Val Kilmer. Val Kilmer. God bless Val Kilmer. God bless Val Kilmer. Above that, I've got Alex Garland's Min. I give Min a 7 out of 10. A lot of great qualities, but they've still got some things to work out. And the movie was pretty good, too. I'm on the fence. I'm on the fence about that one. Because there's stuff I like about Min. There is good stuff in this movie. But so much of it is, just, like, it just hits you over the head with what it's about. It's like, do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get what, what we're saying? Do you get it, guys? Do you get it? And maybe it's because Alex Garland's last movie, Annihilation, was, like, universally misunderstood by, like, so many people online. Now, like... The smart people, the people I, I consider, like, reputable film critics, they all got it. Like, most people got it. But there were a lot of people online who were just, like, completely went over their heads. And they were completely, like, confidently, confidently talking out of their ass about Annihilation. So maybe it was like... Okay, now we're gonna make one that hits you over the head with it, so no one misunderstands what I'm saying. So everyone gets the point. But, uh, <laughs> I, I think that is to the film's detriment. I feel like this film really could have used some subtlety. I, I also feel like, uh, there's like, there's like this really gross CG effect near the end, and it's kind of supposed, it's kind of supposed to be gross, but it's kind of gross in a way I don't think they intended, just because, like, the CG is really bad. It's bad CG, and that makes what is intended to be gross so much worse to look at. But that being said, there are some very scary moments, like some genuinely suspenseful moments in this movie, and I I can't like disregard that. I I there is a lot about this movie that that works, and like Alex Garland, he's a good director. I've enjoyed his other two movies, Ex Machina and Annihilation. I think both of them are great, great movies. Men, I I have issues with it. I don't think it's like a great movie or anything. And I, I, I almost feel like it could be if it, if it tried a little harder, but there's just, there's just like a few things about it that just do not work. And I, I, I kind of, I'm not into what it is ultimately. Um, worth watching maybe once if, if you're interested. If you like Alex Garland's other movies, worth a watch, but... I'm probably not going to revisit this one, where Annihilation and uh, uh, Ex Machina, both great movies, I could go back to at any time. The House, not to be confused with Houseu House, The House, or House MD. This is a movie Mitzi wanted to watch, um, and it's interesting. It's a like a... I want to say it's a horror anthology, because the first two segments are horror, but then the third segment is just not horror at all. It's, like, pure fantasy. So maybe it's a fantasy anthology? It, it, it's this stop-motion movie with these three stories that all take place in this same house, and weirdly... Or, or not, not like, the same house. It's a different house in every story, but it's still the same 
set for the house. It's still the same, uh, the same model for the house. That's the word I was looking for. Um, weirdly, in spite of the first two being horror and the third one not being horror, it's the first segment that kind of stands out because the other two are both about anthro animals. And the other two are also both sort of about, like, letting go of the past and, and moving on and how, like, eventually time decays all things. And the first one is not about that. The first one uh, is kind of more about, like, consumerism, I guess. So it, it, it feels a little out of place with the other two because it's about human characters and it's got totally different themes than the other two. I also kind of think it's, like, the weak link in the, the anthology. That tends to happen with anthologies. There does tend to be one that's, like, weaker than the others. Granted, in this case, I would not say that one is much weaker than the others, but uh, I, I definitely enjoyed the second and third segments better than the first one. The second segment is really good. I'd probably... I'd pro if I If I had to, like rate each segment individually i'd say the first segment is like a six out of ten the second one's like an eight out of ten and the last one's like a seven out of ten so like pretty consistent quality there i i love seeing it in stop motion like th this was a good year for stop motion weirdly enough uh like I, although this was a netflix original i think i think the house went right to netflix so, all three stop-motion movies I saw this year were Netflix movies. Shout out to Netflix for keeping stop-motion alive. And, I mean, of, of the stop-motion films I saw this year, this one was my least favorite, both in terms of story and animation. I think both other films, oh, both other stop-motion films I saw had more interesting stories and better animation, but... Nonetheless, I, I quite enjoyed the house. It's like an interesting little curiosity if you want to check it out. Um, I mean, it's not like great or anything, but it's it's cute. I enjoyed it. All right, here it is. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is the first good video game movie ever. It's the first good video game movie ever. I enjoyed Sonic the Hedgehog 2. <laughs> Which I was kind of not expecting to. Me, me, like, it looked like it was going to be better than the first one, at least. But I was like... By the end of it, I'm like, no. This is a good Sonic movie. This is what I wanted from a Sonic movie. Like, the first movie with the fucking Smurfs Masters of the Universe plot. Where they come to the real... Where Sonic... Sonic alone comes to the real world, and the only other character from the games is Eggman. It's like, fuck off. This one? Plenty of characters from the games. You got Tails and uh, Knuckles in there, and they're both great. I love both of them in this movie. They're so well written in this movie. Eggman, I think, feels a lot more like Eggman in this movie. Plus, you get more of... <laughs> Uh, my favorite original character from the movies, Agent Stone. I love Robotnik and Stone's relationship. Oh god, they're so fucking gay. This is such a gay movie. <laughs> like, my god, these two are fucking gay. And I, I also think it's funny that, like, Eggman has a sidekick that is, like, this dedicated to him. Like, most of Eggman's sidekicks, they either fear him... Or they, like, actually resent him. You know, like, Scratch and Grounder, uh, Q-Bot and Orbot, they're, they're just sort of like, Oh no, it's, it's Dr. Robotnik, oh, we better do what he says. Also, those two robots from Sonic X, I forget their names. They can be Orbot and Q-Bot, I, I don't give a shit. And, and then he has, like, characters like... Uh, you, you, I mean, there's uh, Gamma, Gamma 208, who f canonically wants him fucking dead. I love that, too. That's, like, the opposite end. But I, I love that Agent Stone is, like, in love with Dr. Robotnik. <laughs> I, they, they have a very funny relationship to me. Uh, now, the one thing people complain about with this movie is that there's, like, a very long wedding scene that goes on longer than it should, and it focuses on, uh, James Marsden's character from the first movie, and it's, like, 
kind of a pace killer because you cut away from all the Sonic characters for this boring wedding thing. And, like, I get that, but... At the same time, I was kind of enjoying myself through those parts. I get that, like, narratively, they're not... Like, it, it is kind of a pace killer. But I, I kind of enjoyed those when I was watching it. Granted, I was drunk at the time. Um, and uh, my friend Michael, who's, like, huge Sonic fan, as evidenced by his channel, Spiny Norman... He says with every viewing of this, he's liked it a little bit less. So I might, I might like Sonic the Hedgehog 2 a little bit less on a revisit. But uh, for what it's worth, when I saw it the first time, pretty fun movie. I really liked this movie. The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. I, I enjoyed watching this one. I enjoyed this while I was in the theater with it. But I've soured a little bit on it with time. I, like, it just hasn't sat with me very well like when i'm wa when i was watching it right like all the good moments i think really hit like there are a lot of really good moments in this movie that hit just right and i'm like okay this is funny this i enjoy this movie but like with time i i've also gone like well actually a lot of that movie was like not that great <clears throat> Oof, this is the problem with tr just drinking soda. I'm, like, actually getting dehydrated. I need to, like, get up and get water. <sighs> uh, the best part of this movie is... Pedro Pascal and Nicolas Cage just sort of hanging out. That part is hilarious. It, it feels like they felt obligated to add this, like, bigger sort of action-y story to the movie. And they really didn't need to. It really could have just been Nicolas Cage and Pedro Pascal just hanging out. That could have been the whole movie. And I'd have been completely fine with that. Just the two of them writing a movie together. Man, R.I.P. Donald Kaufman. You'd have loved this one. Tiffany Haddish is in this movie. And uh, as you'll recall last year, I, I praised her performance in Bad Trip. She is like far and away the best part of Bad Trip. They do nothing with her in this movie. She does not have a single funny line in this entire film. Just a complete waste of Tiffany Haddish. Granted, I've also seen her in some stuff where she was very annoying, and she was not annoying in this either, but that's just because, like, she doesn't do anything. She's just, like, she's like a CIA agent, and, like, she's there to spout exposition to Nick Cage, and that's it. That's all that she does the whole movie. Complete misuse of Tiffany Haddish. Just a, an absolute waste of a talented actress. Now, one thing I have to address, uh, I, I have long maintained that there are, in fact, two distinct Nicolas Cages. There is Nicolas Cage, the movie star, and Nicolas Cage, the actor. Nicolas Cage, the actor, is in films like Leaving Las Vegas, an adaptation. He's a very good actor. He's very dramatic. Nicolas Cage, the movie star, is in shit like Face Off and Con Air and Ghost Rider when he's just like crazy off-the-wall action hero. So to answer the eternal burning question, is Nicolas Cage a good actor? My answer is Nicolas Cage, the actor, is a good actor. Nicolas Cage, the movie star, not so much. He, he, he had his day. Back in the 90s, Nicolas Cage, the movie star, killer. Loved him. I think Nicolas Cage, the movie star, is kind of washed up. And Nicolas Cage, the actor, has been retired for a while. But I think he's coming back. He's coming back. Like, Mandy, I think, really kicked off, like, a renaissance of Nicolas Cage films. I also think it helped that he finally paid off, like, all of his debts to the IRS. So now he can, like, make movies he actually wants to make and doesn't just have to say yes to whatever script comes across his desk. But, uh, yeah, I, I think we are living in a renaissance of Nicolas Cage, so, uh, I appreciate that. 
Uh, it's good to see Nicolas Cage, the actor, back in action. Although I would very much say this film is Nicolas Cage, the movie star. But uh, sort of my point was, this movie seems to be in agreement with me. As, like, there, there's a few scenes in the movie where Nicolas Cage is, like, talking to himself. There's two Nicolas Cages. And it seems like one is Nick Cage, the actor, and the other is Nick Cage, the movie star. So it, it's clear the writers of this film sort of understood who Nicolas Cage was and, and what worked about him as an actor. Uh, unfortunately, I feel like they don't really do a great like they they reference a bunch of his movies but they don't do a great job paying homage to them so much mostly it's just like saying the names of them really the only ones that get too much focus are <clears throat> uh guarding tests and face off those are like the two big ones although they do mention mandy and they do pedro pascal does say mandy was a masterpiece which it is that is factually correct so points for that overall uh unbearable weight of massive talent there's fun stuff i enjoyed watching it i might revisit it just to see how it feels on a rewatch but it, it might it might not hit quite as well on a rewatch. That is my prediction, is that it is not going to hit quite as well on a rewatch. Then we got Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. This current phase of Marvel movies has kind of been pretty mixed. Because, although, like, weirdly, they... they <laughs> like, in previous phases, you've got, like, wildly variant qualities. This phase, it's all sort of, like... Yeah, that was okay. You Good job. You did an okay movie. Way to go. Okay movie. Now, Quantumania, and honestly, The Eternals, I have heard not very good things about. But otherwise, it seems to be pretty middle of the road. I've just kind of been okay with the few installments I've seen, which... Honestly, I think it's just been Doctor Strange and... Uh, Spider-Man No Way Home. I think those are the only two from this phase that I've watched. And I think, like, they're really trying to bring back what worked about those old Spider-Man movies that kind of kicked off our current comic book obsession. Granted, before that, you did have, like, Blade and X-Men. But I think Spider-Man was, like, the final one that's like, okay, superhero movies are a thing now. They're big now. We're gonna do this. And we've been riding that wave, like, way longer than we should be. Honestly, like... The MCU, I think, was exactly the evolution comic book movies needed, superhero movies needed, to keep their relevancy going. I think it would have died out a while ago without the MCU. But now that we've hit the end of the MCU, I, I, feel, like, I, I feel the cultural impact of these superhero movies sort of dying out. Um, I, I think in a few years, like, we... We won't be seeing nearly as many superhero movies as we have been seeing up to this point. But uh, my point was, they're bringing stuff back from those original Spider-Man movies. Uh, with No Way Home, it was Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. And with this, it's Sam Raimi. Sam Raimi's directing. Um, and you can feel Sam Raimi's style fighting against the boundaries of the MCU. <laughs> like, he is, he is trying so hard to break free of the constraints of the MCU. And in a few places, he pulls it off. But it, it's, it's just not as nuts or as insane as it should be. If, if Sam Raimi had, like, full creative control of this movie... It would be so much better. He, and and it's it feels very clear to me that he did not. Uh, I also think it's kind of lame that they, they go to like what, two different universes, maybe three. They, they, like a majority of this film is spent in like the same two or three universes. And that's just kind of lame to me. I I feel like they 
They, they should have done more with this. They should have done more. In a year where everything, everywhere, all at once came out, you should have done more with the multiverses. I suppose it was cool getting to see Patrick Stewart as Dr. X again. Um, but, I mean... <laughs> honestly, like, that whole... They, they introduce all these characters in this alternate... The Illuminati. They only introduce the Illuminati in this alternate universe. And then they get their ass handed to them pretty fucking quick. And it's like, wow, that sure was... Like, that's something Deadpool 2 did as a joke. Was introduce all of these characters and then just immediately kill them off. This movie does it without a shred of irony. This movie just introduces these characters and pretty much immediately has them die. But, I mean, it's certainly a, a more visually interesting Marvel movie than we've had in a while. There is a lot of very fun, very cool moments in this film. So, I, I don't totally hate it. it. It is, I think, one of the better installments in the MCU. Granted, I, I also thought the first Doctor Strange was one of the better installments. But, uh, yeah, that's about where I land on, on Doctor Strange. In the Multiverse of Madness. You couldn't you couldn't even have had a cameo for the 70s Doctor Strange. You couldn't have spared 2 fucking seconds to show the 70s Doctor Strange. You had a cameo for Bruce Campbell. You you, you could have you could have slipped the other Doctor Strange in there at some point, somewhere. Aqua Teen Forever, Plantasm, the all new Aqua Teen Hunger Force movie. This is a great movie if you are a fan of Aqua Teen Hunger Force. If you are not familiar with the show, this movie will do nothing for you. <laughs> I will say, I, I like the original Aqua Teen Hunger Force movie, Aqua Teen Hunger Force colon movie film for theaters, a little more than this one. Just cause, like, it's so goofy and, and like... No, non it's complete nonsense but it's it's complete nonsense on such a like an epic scope this one feels more in its lane right this was like a straight to video release no theatrical release it's an hour 15 it's it's much more like the only people who are going to even touch this movie are Aqua Teen fans. Aqua Teen Hunger Force colon movie film for theaters feels like it is fucking trolling people by being a theatrically released movie. Like, why was this a theatrically released movie? Aqua Teen Forever Plantasm. This is like... Yeah, that's kind of what I expected from an Aqua Teen movie. I, it, feels, it feels a little in line with, say, like... The Rocco's Modern Life movie or, or uh, Invader Zim Enter the Florpus. Granted, Aqua Teen hasn't been off the air nearly as long as those two. But, you know, it's like this show's been off the air a little while and uh, now we're catching back up with these old characters in this kind of goofy story. You know, there's this story reminiscent of, like, the stuff they would do. But now it's, like, e expanded time... Runtime, expanded runtime. That's the word I was looking for. The uh, <laughs> the the Amazon commentary. I feel like maybe dates it a little. It it is very like like a lot of the movies focused on this like Amazon parody and like how shitty Amazon is as a company. And it's like, yep, you're correct. Amazon fucking sucks. Uh, that's not really like a super original commentary you got there but i mean i don't think it ever takes that commentary super seriously so it it kind of works and plus like they've got like these weird alien creatures thrown in there to, to, to make it like that extra little aqua teen hunger force flair um and <laughs> the whole plot of like Frylock is trying to make the, the Jeff Bezos stand in taller, and instead he just makes a taller clone of the Jeff Bezos guy who starts bullying the original Jeff Bezos. I don't know, it's 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 exactly what I wanted from a return to Aqua Teen Hunger Force. And and I bought the Blu-ray because I want 
Warner to know that I will pay for more Aqua Teen content. Please, more Aqua Teen content. I am here for it. If you're not an Aqua Teen fan, this movie will do nothing for you. Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. This was an extremely well animated film. This, this might be like the best looking stop motion I have ever seen in a movie. This is a beautiful movie. Beautiful movie. I don't... I don't know if, like, the story really works for me. I have I have issues with the story. It feels... Like, it feels like... They've sort of set this up as, like... Because Pinocchio, it's a very obvious, very outward morality tale. And it feels like, with this film... Uh, Del Toro has set the story of Pinocchio against the backdrop of fascist Italy as sort of like a commentary, sort of a, a, a subversion on morality tales, like what happens to a morality tale when, you know, it's, it's the fascists who are trying to tell the morals. But I don't think it ever goes far enough or deep enough into that idea to like work it it feels like it falls short of really where i would want that concept to go now there there are moments it has its moments it, it is like a somewhat emotional movie although it kind of it does kind of hit you right in the face with like the dead son shit <laughs> but I don't know, it's 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 a good like story device to like start up the movie, but uh I it it just feels it feels just a little just a little manipulative to like write out the gate like he has a dead son. It's the dead son. Cry, cry, damn you. I'm glad Del Toro finally got his Pinocchio movie made. It's it's a very visually beautiful movie. With some ideas that I feel like were maybe not as fleshed out as I want them to be. But, in the end, I, I still do think it's a decent story. I mean, I haven't seen the other two Pinocchio movies that came out this year. But, I assume it's better than those. I, I liked Ewan McGregor as Jiminy Cricket. I don't know if that's actually his name. His, his name might just be Cricket in this one. Jiminy Cricket might be copyright trademark Disney. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe his name is Jiminy Cricket. I forget. Maybe his name's just, like, Cricket or something. Because <laughs> I know in a movie we're about to talk about in a few seconds, uh, Jiminy Cricket's also in that movie, and he just goes by Cricket in that. But Del Toro's Pinocchio. Visually very interesting. I, I wish I liked the story a little better than I did. But, I mean, there's still stuff about it I like. There's a lot about it I appreciate. Um, just not, not my favorite thing. Not my favorite stop motion movie of the year, even. Um, but we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Tar. Um, so I never thought Grapes of Wrath had a very good story. It's like weirdly paced characters just like leave the story randomly. Uh, it, it's, it's not... I don't think Grapes of Wrath has a very good story. But when I read that book, I could not put it down. Because John Steinbeck has really good prose, right? He has an entire chapter in there that's just about a turtle crossing the street. And it's really interesting. It's, it's like, this is a good chapter. Because John Steinbeck's prose is amazing. Tar has a very boring story. I do not really like the story of Tar. But the presentation of this movie? Killer. I love everything about how this movie is made. I love the cinematography. I love the acting. I, I, I love the, the, the sets and the lighting and the everything. It's just a, a beautifully made movie about this really boring story. It's just this bougie woman going about her business, just, like, living her life. And, like, there is, like, this, like, little thread that goes through the movie. But 
it's it's like not that much of the movie, honestly. <laughs> most most of it is just her going about her business, just being a conductor. I don't know. Just like I don't like the story of this movie. I found the story of Tar very, very boring. The presentation is glorious. The presentation is beautiful. It's it's a great movie to watch. I this I think is my current second place pick for best picture. Not in terms of what I want to win best picture, but what I think will win best picture. I would say this one is my second place pick. Fablemans is my first choice. I think Fablemans is what is going to win. This would I would say is like the runner up to that, and then I would say Avatar Two honestly is the dark horse there. I I, I think it's going to be one of those three. That is my guess at this point. Um, there is another movie in that discussion that we will get to, but currently that's that's where I I think things are. And I would not be disappointed if Tar won Best Picture. Honestly, I think the only nominee right now I would be upset by is All Quiet on the Western Front, and that's only because I avoided watching All Quiet on the Western Front cuz it looks like a really boring generic war movie and I don't want to have to watch it, but if it wins Best Picture, I will watch it, and I kind of don't want to, so I hope that one does not win. Anything else? Yeah, okay, I'm fine with all of these. There is one that I want to win, but we'll get to that. <laughs> I, I really like the presentation. Do not really enjoy the story. If you get into this story, hey, good, great, good for you. I, I found it quite dull, but... The presentation more than makes up for it, which is rare. Which is rare. Because the, there are a lot of movies I think are boring that have good presentation that I'm still like, okay, yeah, good presentation, movie still sucks. That's the thing. I don't think the story to this is, like, awful, right? The story is, like, just there enough. It is just interesting enough that I, I accept the film because of its presentation. Right, it is not a not a horrendously dull movie. It's just like I don't know, on paper I would not be interested in this movie, but the presentation elevates it. Above that I've got Mr. Steven Spielberg's The Fablemans, a semi autobiographical film about how Mr. Spielberg got into filmmaking and you know, his early days in filmmaking. And all of the parts about him making movies I think are really cool and really interesting. When it stops to be a drama about his family, I start to lose interest, honestly. And part of it, like, there is stuff in those parts that is entertaining, but, like, this movie goes on way longer than it needs to. Way longer than it needs to. This could have been, like, 30 minutes shorter and it'd be a much better movie for it. Oh my god, this movie is too long. Like, focus. Focus on the parts about you being a filmmaker, right? That's what we're here to see. We're here to see how Steven Spielberg became Steven Spielberg. All this extra family drama, it just sort of drags down the movie. It, it just sort of bogs down what should be a celebration of, like, one of the most important people in cinema history, right? <laughs> like, if I had to list, like, the most important people in film, probably number one is going to Walt Disney. Number two is Steven Spielberg. Spielberg belongs right below Disney in terms of importance to film history. Because he has directed some of the most classic and iconic films in history and produced even more. So I, I, I have a lot of respect for Steven Spielberg. Focus this movie on celebrating Spielberg as an artist. And I get it. it. It is Spielberg. Spielberg's making the movie. So maybe he wanted to talk about, like, oh, here's, like, all my family drama. The stuff that was going on in my family when I was growing up. I don't know. I was way more interested in the parts that were just him making movies. Like, there's a, a scene where he's making this war movie with his Boy Scout troop, and it's so good. <laughs> It's such a good scene. Like, 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 first off, like, the war scene he's shooting is, like, a pretty cool scene in and of itself. But, uh, on, on top of that, um, like, j just seeing how he set it up, how he, he 
filmed all of this is is like really interesting it's it's a really fun thing to watch and then it just loses me with this like dragged out story about his family drama and like this romance he had with this high school girl although that that i think sort of is like I, I, it feels like something that comes back in his movies, right? You see some of his early, like, uh, like 50s, 60s nostalgia films, and you kind of get the sense that, like, some of this was based on his real experience with this girl, but, I don't know, it didn't do a whole lot for me. I, I vastly preferred watching a young Steven Spielberg become a filmmaker. But currently, it's what I think is going to win Best Picture. Maybe it won't, but it's... The Oscars loves movies about movies. The Oscars loves Steven Spielberg. This is a movie about Steven Spielberg making movies. <laughs> I think they might just give it to him. Because honestly, it's kind of a weird lineup this year. We, we don't have the obligatory racism is bad movie. We don't have the obligatory gay movie. I guess Tar is kind of that. But, like, it's not really a great depiction of, of a gay person, if I'm being honest. So, uh, Fablemans feels like the safe pick for best picture. Moving on. I did it again. I just said moving on. Like it's I gotta come up with something better than that. Above that, uh, Jordan Peele's Nope. Um, I kind of want to rewatch this one honestly. Like I I am not really sure how I feel about it just after a, a, a single viewing. If I revisited this, I might go, okay, no, this one's really solid. Or I might go, ooh, I ranked that one a little too high. I, I don't think it's really that good. I don't think it's as deep as his other two movies. Granted, I still think it's a better movie than Us. Uh, I would say it is definitely better than Us and definitely not as good as Get Out. It is definitely in the middle of his two other films. But I can't really say where in the middle. I don't know. <laughs> like, there's, there's a lot about this movie I liked. But ultimately, I don't feel like I got it the first time I watched it. I feel like I really had to, like... It, it took me some time to really process what he was trying to say with this film. And uh, granted, in the end, I, I, I did kind of figure it out. I think it's mostly about, like... The ways we use animals in film and the ways we use animals in as, like, sort of a spectacle and how, like, maybe that's not the best thing because animals can be violent and unpredictable and sometimes they lash out when when we're not expecting them to. And, and you sort of see that reflected with this alien creature that they're trying to get footage of to, to like use as a spectacle like uh, i mean uh the the guy over on the ranch next to them is like he, he has this whole big like ooh come see the ufo show and <laughs> it's like I, I i i i get i get what he's going for now, I don't think I got that on my first viewing. I think that took me a while to really process. I fucking love the subplot with the monkey. The monkey's hilarious. I love that shit. But, I... Like, honestly, honestly... I was really into this movie through most of it. I was super on board. And then the climax happened, and it just... I don't know, it didn't, I, I, the climax didn't feel satisfying to me, I guess is what I, I'll say. And there's also, like, zero wrap-up, right? There is no wrap-up at the end of this movie. And, and that, I think, also kind of hurts it. So, everything up to, like, the big climax where they're trying to get footage of this thing, I think is very good. The climax, I think... I don't know, I'll have to, I, I really want to revisit it, because it's not like it's bad, it's not like a bad climax or anything, it's just like, I don't know, I, 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 I left feeling a little unsatisfied with, with where things ended off, and maybe a revisit would help with that, or maybe it wouldn't, maybe on a revisit I'd be like, nah, this is actually not as good as I thought it was, but, eh, 
uh, that's where I am on Nope right now. It's good. I need to revisit it. Like, and the, let me be clear. It is a good movie. Like I said, it's better than Us. And even Us, I thought, was like an okay movie. I do recommend you see Nope. It's, it's a good movie. Don't go in expecting Get Out. Get Out, I think, is like a great movie. I think Get Out is like probably a 10 out of 10. This, no, this is maybe an 8 at the highest. Uh, I have given it a 7. It might go down to a 6 on a revisit. Or it could go up to an 8. I can't tell you right now. Maybe it'll stay right at a 7. Maybe I'll rewatch it and be like, no, nah, 7's fair. Maybe I'll rewatch it and still not know how to feel about it. <laughs> uh, that's just where I am with it right now. I've seen it once. I saw it once in theaters, so... I'll, I'll, I'll have to revisit it at some point. Up next, we've got Weird, the Al Yankovic story. I have been a Weird Al obsessive for so long, I, I kind of had to see this, and that's a bit of a problem, because I, I, I already saw this movie back in 2010. It was two minutes long, and it starred Aaron Paul, and it was phenomenal. Uh, I think turning that fake trailer into a full movie kind of spoils some of the humor. I think that story is funnier. I, I think the idea is funnier as a trailer. Still, though, if you're gonna make, like, just a wildly inaccurate biopic about someone... I think Weird Al is the perfect person to do it on. It's it's almost a parody of biopics. Here's here's my big criticism with this movie. I wish it was weirder. I wish it went even more insane with what it was doing. Because, like, there are some really over-the-top ridiculous moments in this movie. And those moments are amazing. I love them. And then there's just a lot of stuff that I feel like is kind of limp. That kind of, like doesn't add a whole lot like uh, that original like fake trailer with uh aaron paul in it in that in like the whole thing is that like oh weird owl is like this raging alcoholic and they bring that back in this movie and it just goes nowhere it's there for like two scenes and then it's it's dropped like as soon as he breaks up with madonna it's just doesn't come back and there's nothing particularly funny about it while while it's happening uh, unfortunately weird the al yankovic story has to exist in the shadow of walk hard the dewey cox story and walk hard is just way better <laughs> in so many regards even even dealing with like that alcohol thing Dewey Cox, it's like a continually escalating joke that, like, he is constantly getting into harder and harder and harder drugs. So, yeah, I, I, I don't think Weird the Al Yankovic story quite stacks up to the Dewey Cox story. I will say it is funny because it's based on a real person. A real person famous for making comedy music. I, yeah, I just, I just wish it went even more insane than it did, because, like, yeah, uh, it's, it's hilarious that he starts dating Madonna in this, of course, but that was also something that was in, like, the Aaron Paul version, um, and then, like, Madonna takes over, like, he kills Pablo Escobar, and Madonna takes over the cartel, and I, I love everything they did with, like, Eat It and, and Michael Jackson. That's all hilarious. No spoilers. I won't, I won't tell you what they do, but it's, it's very funny what they do with Eat It. <laughs> and, and just the, like, <laughs> they keep doing this same gag of, like, someone will say the lyrics to one of his songs and he's like, Wait say that again and then he he writes a whole song about it because that happens so much in fucking biopics that's such like a trope of these films that 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 stuff's all really funny it's a really funny movie i do enjoy weird the al yankovic story i just wish it went even more insane that is my one gripe with this movie make it even weirder make it even crazier <laughs> But I did enjoy it. We have moved to the, the portion of the list where I liked these movies. These are the good movies of the year. Above that, we've got Pearl, a prequel to Ty West's X. Released the same year as X, 
that to me kind of says like maybe he had written Pearl's backstory into X and eventually he's like this is way too long this is bogging down the movie okay Pearl's backstory you're your own movie now <laughs> That is, that is the sense I get from this. Now, I think Mia Goth has a writing credit on Pearl where she doesn't on X. So maybe it was more she and Ty West on the set of X were like developing Pearl's backstory. And at some point they go, okay, this has got to be its own movie too. Sort of like what Tarantino and Uma Thurman did with Kill Bill on the set of Pulp Fiction. I don't know. I don't I don't know the story behind Pearl, but it's it does strike me as odd that a prequel to X came out just a couple months after X. I did not like this as much as X. I think I enjoy X a lot more. But that being said, um I do think this is a more unique movie than X. This is not, like, a slasher send-up. This is, like... I, I mean, this is, like, the backstory to a slasher villain. Like, literally. It's the backstory to a slasher villain. And it, it feels like... You know, you took, like... I, I mean, it'd have to... Like, you, you took, like, Mrs. Voorhees from the first Friday the 13th. And give me a backstory about her. Give me a story about her as a child. It'd probably be a lot like this movie. And I really appreciate that about the film. It's it's a unique take, I think. I don't think there are any, like, slasher franchises that have done this. And so I, I think it's a very unique take on the slasher format. To just have, like, an entire backstory for this slasher villain. And it's... It's sort of a sympathetic backstory. You do feel bad for Pearl, I think. But also you get the sense that she's, like, not a good person. That, like, she's, like, deep down she is a deeply disturbed person who desperately needs help that she is not gonna get. Also, fucking Mia Goth kills it in this movie. Oh, uh, Mia Goth has, like quickly become one of my favorite working actresses like but it was like I, I i loved her in x but she is like phenomenal in this movie i i love mia goth in this movie she is so good uh like she she is the reason to watch this movie <laughs> I know that is not a unique take pretty much everyone who praises pearl is like oh yeah mia goth fuck yeah mia goth but Fuck yeah, Mia Goth. Th this is a movie that was very much made for the letterboxed lesbians. You know, the, not not enough words have been said about the amount of lesbians on Letterboxd. You go to like any movie, it's like three to one. One of the top reviews is from someone with the lesbian flag in their profile pic. And uh, Pearl, this is a movie for them. This is <laughs> this is the letterboxed lesbian movie. <laughs> I love it. I, I really enjoyed Pearl. Very fun movie. Has my recommendation. Not as high as X. Watch X first. Start with X. X is a much better movie. Although, maybe not. Maybe you disagree with me. Maybe you'll watch these and be like, nah, Pearl's the better movie. I enjoyed X more. I enjoyed Pearl a lot too. So I, I recommend it. Above that, we've got Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. Another movie I have to go, yeah, I really liked this one. I do not love it the way a lot of people seem to. <laughs> it's fun. It's a very good movie. Very entertaining movie. Uh, very... I mean... <laughs> everyone's praised the visuals on this, right? Like, the, these guys looked at Into the Spider-Verse and said, Oh, shit. We can make a really fun, really unique looking CG films if we just do this. And so, and they only do it for the action scenes where Spider-Verse did it kind of the whole movie. But it works. It's really good. It's, it, it gives like the film this very unique feel. Like the only thing that's really like it is Into the Spider-Verse, which is a really visually great movie. Into the Spider-Verse, I think is like revolutionary 
in the field of 3D animation. I think Into the Spider-Verse has changed the game. And here's the proof of that. Uh, these guys are kind of copying Into the Spider-Verse, and it's fucking working. <laughs> Uh, this is a movie that, like, wasn't even on my radar, right? Because I haven't seen the first Puss in Boots. I have not seen the first Puss in Boots movie. And really, you don't need to. There's a character in this from the first Puss in Boots, but they do a good enough job of establishing who she is pretty quick that, like, it, it doesn't really matter that much. But, like, I'm like, oh god, they made another Puss in Boots movie? Why? Pfft, I'm not watching that. And then it comes out and universal praise like everyone was like oh my god puss in boots the last wish great movie you gotta see it so uh th this was my valentine's day actually i took mitzi to see this on valentine's day it's a good valentine's day movie um and uh yeah it's a good fucking movie i liked it i really liked it um the story i think is uh, a touch predictable I did see a lot of what was coming, but um, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Like, I, I, I definitely prefer a movie that, like, throws some surprises in, but, you know, I, uh, this movie managed to be fun and humorous and entertaining in spite of me being able to tell where pretty much everything was going. <laughs> also, I, I mean, everyone's loving on death. Death... Extremely cool design, extremely cool character. Jack Horner, what a fucking villain, man. What a great fucking villain. <laughs> Love him. Love him. Also, I, I really appreciate this movie's dedication to, like, the PG rating. Like, this is, this movie hits, like, the raunchiness of those original Shrek movies. And, like, I, I have long bemoaned that, like, Shrek and Shrek 2 were, like, the last real PG films, right? The last time PG films were allowed to be, like, dirty and filthy. Because nowadays, like, like Up and Frozen are, are PG. And it's like, why? What about Up and Frozen are PG? These are G-rated films that you have slapped the PG rating on for... Who knows why? This is a PG movie. This movie is, like, raunchy. You cannot show this to, like, little, little kids. There is, like, some swearing in this movie that gets bleeped out. Every time they swore and it was bleeped out, I just, like, lost it. I was laughing my ass off in the theater every time they fucking swore. And, like, like sometimes it's really obvious. Like, one time he, he, like, the character clearly says shit for brains. And they just, they bleeped out shit. But it's shit. It's so obvious he said shit for brains. <laughs> great cast on this movie. All of the voice actors do a great job in this. Um... Antonio Banderas has always been great as Puss in Boots. Uh, that fucking dude from What We Do in the Shadows is uh, the, the little dog, Perito. Death, great voice. Um, John Mulaney <laughs> as Big Jack Horner is very funny. Uh, whoever's voicing the cricket is doing like a spot-on Don Knotts. Um, uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, they all have these like thick Cockney accents and... That's that's a lot of fun. I really like that. Um, it's it's Ray Winstone is one of them. I think, right? Am I wrong? Is it's Ray Winstone, right? But it, uh, yeah, fuck yeah, Ray Winstone. Uh, I love Goldilocks and the Three Bears in this movie. They're very fun characters. Except except in Shrek One, it's confirmed that Mama Bear is dead, and this canonically takes place after Shrek One. So, uh, 0 out of 10. Huge continuity error. The Banshees of Inner Sharon. It, it, the ben, Inner Sharon? Is that it? Did I say it right that time? The ben, Banshees of Inner Sharon. The Banshees of Inner Sharon. I, I'm just gonna go with Inner Sharon. There, there are movies I say sometimes like, well, there's technically nothing wrong with it. It just never really came together for me. And I was worried this was gonna be the, that... But it does really come together for me at the very end. At the very end, it all sort of comes together. And I'm like, yeah, okay, this is a good movie. I enjoyed this movie. It's kind of an odd movie because it's just like, 
it's set in like 1920s Ireland, but that like barely affects anything. And it, it literally just starts with this guy going, yeah, I don't want to be friends anymore. Like you don't get to see them as friends at any point in this movie. It starts at we're not friends anymore. And honestly, like from the way people were describing it, I, I thought it was like a movie of like, okay, this guy decided he didn't want to be friends anymore. And now it's like all these years later and like here's how this has affected them over the years. No, no, it's like just like the, the couple weeks that pass right after he decides he doesn't want to be friends with this guy anymore. Like it's, it's a compelling movie. It's very interesting. I think the acting's really good. It's, it's, I, I like Brendan Gleeson and, uh... Colin Farrell in this a lot. Colin Farrell? Yeah, Colin Farrell. Okay. I'm looking for people named Brendan to sweep uh, b both acting categories, right? Brendan Fraser, best actor. Brendan Gleeson, best supporting actor. Brendan sweep. They were both in a movie called In Bruges, which is <laughs> like a very different movie. That's like this over-the-top like action comedy. But except they're like kind of friends in that too so in a weird way it seems like this is almost like a follow-up <laughs> like my review on letterboxd is wow this in bruges sequel went weird direction <laughs> i might like in bruges more but i feel like a lot of people would disagree with me on that this is certainly the more dramatic of those two movies it is certainly the more like what's the word i'm looking for serious it's the more serious movie anyways banshees of inner sharon i enjoyed it um it's one i'm gonna take my time re-watching right this is not something you can just constantly re-watch but uh like like it's kind of it's it's maybe a little hard to get through not as hard to get through as tar like <laughs> I was complimenting Tar. I neglected to mention that it took me three sittings to get through all of Tar. It is way too long and the story is way too dull to get in one sitting. I cannot... Um, I would probably hate that movie if I saw it in theaters. But because I got to sit down and watch it just in chunks, I can be like, Okay, we're taking a break from this movie. If you take Tar in chunks, fairly enjoyable. Banshees of Inner Sharon, uh... I'm not going to revisit, like, quickly. It's not, like, on the top of my revisit list. But I could come back to it someday. You know, it, it is a good movie. I will probably watch it again eventually. Barber Westchester. This is <laughs> an odd one. This is something uh, Michael wanted to show us. It's from... Uh, hold on. Joni Phillips... Who, uh, who does, like, animation on YouTube. And in fact, Barbara Westchester is the feature-length follow-up to a short series she made called uh, Secrets and Lies in a Town Full of Sinners. There it is. Secrets and Lies in a Town Full of Sinners. <clears throat> Barbara Westchester is sort of the follow-up. Um, follows this, like, one character from the series who's, like, the daughter of this cult leader who's, like, getting into, like, NASA and space exploration. And there's all these, like, weird conspiracies going on uh, with, like, NASA and, uh, and all that shit. And it's got, like, a very fun uh, animation style. It does change up styles a few times. There are some, like, guest animators who have come in to do, like, a scene or two. But mostly it's Joni Phillips, who has this, like, very sketchy art style. You know, they, like, the style where kind of, like, you know, they draw the character two or three times and it doesn't quite match up, so the lines just kind of wiggle while they're doing whatever um it's a neat style and it, it really works for the movie this movie is really funny i enjoyed this movie a whole lot um i don't think you have to see secrets and lies in a town full of sinners to understand it because it is pretty disconnected from that show but at the same time i recommend you watch secrets and lies in a town full of sinners it's a very good show I enjoyed that show and I enjoyed this movie. Um, so, 
yeah, that's my sort of... That's the obscure pick for the list, I suppose. Barbara Westchester. Fun little... I think it's like like the entire movie's on YouTube for free. I'm like pretty sure that is the case. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that is the case. If that is the case, uh, allow me to put it up in the corner. I haven't figured out which corner it is. I, I, had, I had to put like a post-it note on my wall back home so I knew which side the, the thing popped out of. I think it's this side. I really want to say this side. Uh, link to Barbara Westchester if the entire thing is on YouTube. Also, Secrets and Lies in the Town Full of Sinners. I'll put that one there too. The Batman. Alright, listen. The Batman, it's a good movie. I enjoyed this movie. I am very happy with this movie. I am so sick of seeing this version of Batman. Come on. Come on. This movie makes me pine for the Tim Burton Batman movie. Tim Burton really knew how to balance the darkness of Batman as a character with fun superhero antics, right? This is the same Batman we've been dealing with since Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy came out. And in fairness, again, I liked this movie. I am currently headcanoning this as the third installment of the Dark Knight trilogy. Uh, Dark Knight Rises never happened. It's just the Batman. The Batman is the third movie in that series. I don't know what you're talking about when you say Dark Knight Rises. That's that, that name doesn't ring a bell to me. I think you're thinking of the Batman. That was the third movie in the Dark Knight trilogy. Now, where I think this differs from the Dark Knight, the Dark Knight was sort of... How do we make Batman exist in the real world, right? Like, it's very grounded. It's very realistic. But at the end of the day, you're still getting Batman. You're still getting the traditional Batman you have always known. The Batman is much more, what if Batman did exist in real life? There's something I appreciate about that. Like, it's a very... <laughs> He's a very low-tech Batman. He doesn't have, like, all the crazy, insane sci-fi gadgets that previous Batmans have had. And I also appreciate them kind of addressing, like, the the vigilantism of Batman. I, I love that, like, the, the Riddler sees himself as being on the same side as Batman in, in the movie. Like, oh yeah, we're vigilantes. We're taking down the bad guys. You and me, we're on a team. That I think that's interesting commentary on Batman as a character. And and I even enjoy, like, the, the way they've worked, like, the Penguin into this, right? The Penguin is just a mobster, and that's just a nickname they have given to him. He is the penguin like no there's no like penguin qualities about him it's not horrifying danny devito penguin like it, it works in this movie it does but i think what i really like about batman's villains is like batman is this like dark stoic mysterious guy and all of his villains are these like not so brightly colored goofballs, right? Batman is a very serious character with very silly enemies. His biggest enemy is a fucking clown. Like, come on. Come on. And when you make, when you make the bad guy in the film this, like, gimp-suited serial killer, it's like, I don't know, that feels less fun. There's less contrast. And again, works in this movie. Please stop. Please bring back fun Batman villains. Give me give me a really goofy Joker. Please. Give me a Jack Nicholson. Give me give me a Cesar Romero Joker. Give me someone just who who does crime for fun. He thinks it's fun to do crimes. He thinks it's fun to dress up in silly little outfits and murder people. That is what I want out of, out of a Batman villain. The Batman, it works. It's a good movie. I enjoy this movie. It very easily could have not worked. 
I I fear for the future of this franchise. Please bring back silly Batman villains. Also, fucking release Batgirl. Fuck you, Warner Discovery. Fuck you. Release Batgirl. Fuck you. Wendell and Wild. Hot take. It's my favorite animated movie of the year. <laughs> this, uh, like, it's weird, because this is, like, a collaboration between, uh, uh, Key and Peel and Henry Selleck, the director of Nightmare Before Christmas and Coraline. And... Like, there was hype for it before it came out, and then it came out, and I never heard anything about it. And and then I, when I finally got around to watching it, I'm like, what the fuck? This movie's great! This movie is hilarious! This movie's a whole lot of fun! Uh, obviously, there is stuff in there that is, like, appealing to me personally. I love all the demon shit. I love all the punk shit. I, I kind of appreciate the film's message about for-profit prisons, I do think it's a little on the nose. And by a little on the nose, I mean a character just straight up says what is wrong with for-profit prisons. Like, no subtlety. Zero subtlety. It is just like, let's spell it right out for you. But in fairness, for-profit prisons are a dystopian nightmare, and no one is fucking talking about it. Why are we not talking about how much of a dystopian nightmare for-profit prisons are? Like, you know what? Be on the nose about it. Fuck it. Someone needs to say this shit. For-profit prisons are horrifying. Uh, I, I, I love the visual style of this movie. I love the character design. This is some good character design in this movie. Uh, Wendell and Wilde, uh, very cute looking characters. I like how they're like... They're, they're claymation models, but they're kind of 2D looking when they're in hell. And then they get to the real world and they're a little more three-dimensional in the real world. They also... I, I don't think they uh, exactly look like Key and Peel, But it's clear they're, like, based on Key and Peel, And, like, I'm always down to see more Key and Peel. Fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> they were the best part of Toy Story 4. I did not like Toy Story 4 that much, but those two? Hilarious in that movie. Uh, please, please, more Key and Peel. <laughs> Meet more animated Key and Peel. Please. Um, very funny in this movie. I love, I love that James Hong's character just kind of looks like James Hong. Um, I love the character who's just Marlon Brando. They're just like, Fuck it, this demon hunter at this Catholic school, uh, th this demon hunter disguised as a janitor at a Catholic school, he looks like Marlon Brando. Fuck you, it's Marlon Brando. <laughs> Although he doesn't, he doesn't really have a Brando voice. It would have been very easy to give him a Brando voice. Brando has a very distinct voice, but eh, I, I, I like the look of the character in spite of that. Um... Maybe it's better that he doesn't have, like, a Brando voice because then you get his iconic look and you you don't even have to, like, try to measure up to him. And, uh, the, the main character, Cat. Cat has a very good aesthetic. I love Cat. <laughs> like, honestly, like, a lot of the kids in this movie look like dolls. And not, not in the sense that they're claymation models. Obviously, they look like dolls because they are claymation models. But I mean, like, these look like things I could go into a store and buy, right? This looks like a line of dolls I could buy. <laughs> it's another movie with a character named Shaban. Good movie, good, good year for characters named Shaban, weirdly enough. There's a, there's a character in this movie who's trans and... It's really not much a part of the story, and I kind of appreciate that. I appreciate that a trans character is just allowed to exist in this movie. They maybe put too fine a point on him being trans, and it, it is honestly kind of weird that, like, he has a supportive mother, but she's still making him go to an all-girls school. That's odd to me. But, like, I don't know, maybe it's the only school in town at that point that's possible. They don't really explain that. Like, there could have been a line in there about that and then we just didn't get one. Or she could have just not been supportive. Because, uh, quite unfortunately, a lot of trans people's parents are not. But, uh, 
by and large, like, everyone in the movie is pretty supportive of him. Like, there, no one in this movie has to, like, learn to be better. Um, and I, and, like, you know, I say it doesn't really, like, tie into a, the story. Like, this trans character is just allowed to exist. But it does kind of tie into, I think, the film's deeper themes of, like, being true to yourself. So... Yeah, no, it's it's not like there's no reason for this character to be trans. It does tie into some of the film's themes, but, uh, you know, it's also just nice that he's allowed to exist. I appreciate that. Glass Onion, a Knives Out mystery. I don't think I like this one quite as much as Knives Out, but I still really enjoyed it. This is still a really fun movie. The politics in this movie... Look, I agree with them. I agree with the politics of this movie. It's still liberal pandering. It's still just, like, really on-the-nose liberal pandering. And that bothers me a little. It's, it's like a little trite. It's a little, yeah, yeah. Everyone has already said this. Come on now. But uh, unlike, say, Don't Look Up, uh, this is at least entertaining liberal pandering. I enjoy the movie that surrounds the liberal pandering. So, um, Netflix, please. More Glass Onion, less Don't Look Up. Please. This movie is so wildly entertaining. Uh, Benoit Blanc is just a very funny character to follow around. And much like the first Knives Out, the supporting cast is just a bunch of very talented actors being very good in their respective roles. I, I enjoy every character in this movie. Every character in this movie is fun to follow around. And it genuinely did have me guessing up to the end. I'm like... Who is the... Like, I had a few theories, and by the end, I was starting to piece together, like, well, maybe, maybe it was this character, but <laughs> it's... I don't want to, like, spoil anything. I don't want to say, like, too much, but I do appreciate the ending, the end reveal with this. Because that was that was really where where I think ultimately my my rating and my ranking of this review was hinging on i'm like can they resolve this mystery in an interesting way and they did i i really like how this movie ends good movie very good movie very entertaining movie it has my recommendation above that we've got x this is Matt exploitation. this is a film that is specifically targeted at me personally they wanted to make a movie I wanted to see. And listen, I have like, like soul movies. Movies where I'm like, if you just reached into my head and pulled out exactly the movie I'd wanted to see, you'd get this. Films like Psycho Goreman or Gremlins 2 The New Batch. These are like, oh yes, that is like the perfect movie. That is exactly what I want. This is less that. This is more like they sat down with a focus group but the focus group, every single person in that focus group was me. And then they, they just asked this focus group full of me what type of movie I want to see. And the end result was X. Uh, a story about some filmmakers going out and shooting a porno that turns into a Toby Hooper-esque slasher film. Um, they are pretty fucking blatant with their Toby Hooper references. Especially Texas Chainsaw. A lot of Texas Chainsaw in here. Although, um, the, the killer in this movie f feeds a lot of the victims to a crocodile? Or an alligator? Uh, they're the same thing. Croc th that is a fun fact. Crocodiles and alligators, same species. They are exactly the same. Uh, no difference between them whatsoever. Um, she feeds a lot of her victims to alligators, to an alligator, and I'm like, is this a reference to Eaten Alive? I, like, did they do this? Like, it feels like a deliberate reference to Eaten Alive. Uh, just cause, like, like, they do so much with Texas Chainsaw, and, like, clearly Toby Hooper was, like, a big influence on this film. So it's like, did they just, like, 
Is that a reference to Eaten Alive? Because that's kind of a deep cut for Toby Hooper. Do I have Eaten Alive? Damn it, I don't have Eaten Alive. It's, it's pretty interesting. Not like my favorite Toby... I mean, my favorite Toby Hooper movie is Texas Chainsaw. I, I hope that's very obvious. I fucking love Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That is one of... like th That is the best slasher movie. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is the best slasher movie. I'm sorry. Poltergeist, also brilliant. Uh, love Toby Hooper. Great director. Yeah, X, X has a lot of sin... A lot of, like, homage to Toby Hooper's films. And I also... <laughs> I just love that they're out there filming a porno. <laughs> like a 70s porno. <laughs> it's, uh, and the, the soundtrack, really fun soundtrack in this movie. It's just, it's, it's everything I want in a movie. Again, it's, it's just like you got a focus group of me specifically and ask me what I wanted in a movie. And it's like, yep, here it is. <laughs> this is Ty West. I I'm pretty sure this is only, like, his second movie. At least second full movie. He's done some and thought, okay, maybe I'm wrong. He's, he, okay, he has done some other stuff. But, uh, he is, he's probably previous to this best known for The House of the Devil. And, uh, I think this has got, like, some of the same satire that, like, House of the Devil has. Like, like the... Not even satire. Satire is almost the wrong word. That same, like, dedication to, to like, old horror, but in, like, a very new, unique way, you know? I feel like this is very much in the same vein as House of the Devil. Um, you, you can tell it's the same director. And, you know, I, I really enjoyed House of the Devil, and I really enjoyed X. I'd be hard-pressed to say which one I liked more, honestly. Probably X. Probably X. But you could convince me House of the Devil's better. I don't know. Hard choice. Hard saying. I loved X. Please. Please, by all means, X. Then we got Baz Luhrmann's Elvis. And my god, I'm so glad we all came around on Baz Luhrmann actually being good at, like, the same time. Because... Man, do I love Baz Luhrmann. Uh, <laughs> not all of his films are good. Some of his films are not very good. But he is at least always entertaining. And Elvis is fucking great. It's such a great example of his style. I was almost ready to call this, like, his magnum opus. And then the ending, it kind of... It, it loses steam by the end. And in fairness... I'm not really sure what you could cut. Maybe you could make the ending just a little tighter because it does start to really... Like, the the first opening bits of the movie are so fun and crazy and over the top and then you get to, like, okay, here's the part we have to talk about and it's like... I don't know, it's just not... It's not as fun as... The, and to be fair, it manages to maintain... Like, that high energy for, like, two hours. But once you hit the two-hour mark, it's like, it, it really slows down, and you're like, ah. This could have been higher. Like, if, if the whole movie were as good as, like, those opening bits, I could have gone higher with this. But as it is, I... Like, like, that is the complaint I have heard from pretty much everyone else who has watched it, too. It's just, like, it goes on too long, right? It needed to end sooner. And I get it. I absolutely agree. But, but, those, that first two hours where it's really fun and exciting, that's a great movie, man. That's a great movie. If I rewatch this, I might stop it after the two-hour mark. Because, like, you need that ending bit. I get it. You need that ending bit. But it's just not as fun as the rest of the movie. It's just, it's so wild and stylized and crazy and exactly what you expect from Baz Luhrmann. Exactly what you expect from Baz Luhrmann's Elvis. Because um, there are plenty of movies about Elvis. John Carpenter has one where, like, uh, Kurt Russell plays Elvis. I, I want to watch that one, actually. I haven't seen it, but 
there's a lot of Elvis movies. I think this could easily become like the definitive Elvis biopic. Just because it, it's so good. It's so fun. It matches his energy. It, it really captures what people loved so much about Elvis. You know? And without shying away from the controversies of Elvis either. It is not like a pretty picture of Elvis. It is Elvis as he was, I think. And he managed to do that in a very entertaining way. So... I really enjoyed Elvis. Doesn't maintain energy all the way to the end, but... <sighs> I mean, it's it's hard to when you've got this much to tell. Speaking of high-energy romps of, like, oh boy, here's this thing I love, Damien Chazelle's Babylon. This one did not get a lot of critical praise, and I totally get why, but personally, I love it. This movie sings right to my degenerate little heart, and I just, I, I, I have to love it. Babylon is a party. Not a party movie. It's a party. The whole thing is a party. A party full of skeevy characters that you're not sure you want to be around that goes on way longer than it needs to. Like, this is a party, <laughs> like, you show up at it and you're like, oh, this is awesome, and by the end you're like... Oh my god, I'm ready to go home. Oh my god, fuck this. <laughs> and like... It's three hours. This movie is three hours long. Does it need to be three hours long? No. Would I cut even one second of it? Also, no. It is perfect at the length it is. That it, it is part of the experience that this shit is three hours long. I, honestly, I, I very much put it in the camp with like... Wolf of Wall Street. Both this and Wolf of Wall Street feel very self-important to me. Like they're trying to be some like brilliant masterpiece. And But really I look at both films and I'm just like, this is fun. This is a very fun movie, right? This is like a party movie, you know, in the vein of like Animal House or, or Spring Breakers and like... And obviously, I think, I mean, fucking Animal House, I fucking love. But Animal House knows exactly what it is. I, I probably like Animal House better than Wolf of Wall Street or Babylon. But, like, these movies are trying to be so much more. And it's like, you're fun. You're a fun movie. That is it. Now, you're a very well-made fun movie. The acting is great. Uh, the editing is great. The writing is great. You're not brilliant. You're just fun. You're just a whole, whole lot of fun. And that's all a film needs to be, I think. I appreciate a film that is a lot of fun. Obviously, I've ranked Babylon very high. It is in my top ten. I don't, I don't think it is as important as maybe it thinks it is. Oh, man, I gotta wrap this up. Luckily, I'm on to my top five. Uh, starting with The Northman, the new Roger Eggers movie. My god, fucking finally there's a cool movie about Vikings. I was like really into Vikings in college. I loved Vikings and there's just... Most of Viking movies are either extremely lame or they're like these long dramatic historical epics. Like you get the long dramatic historical epics or you get like the Viking women and their voyage to the waters of the Great Sea Serpent. You know, which is like some cheap thing that, like, Corman threw together. You know, The Northmen? Very cool movie about Vikings. Very cool movie about Vikings. And also one that is not uncritical of its own, like, hyper-masculinity. Like, make no mistakes, it is, it is very much leaning into, like, these hyper-masculine tropes. But it is still ultimately, I think, critical of them. Because, like, by the end of it, you find out, like... I, I mean, oh, I almost don't want to spoil it. May maybe that's a better reveal if you just watch the movie. But I feel it, like by the end of it, it, it does sort of point out that, like, yeah, this, like, hyper-masculine fixation on revenge you have... Uh, and, and on, like, war and, like, being, like, the toughest motherfucker out there. 
in the end, it's, it's like, kind of detrimental to you and the people you're trying to help. But, uh, at the same time, it still manages to be a really fun, really fucking awesome Viking movie. Willem Dafoe's in it, and oh my god, like, he, it's a pretty minor role for Dafoe, but he is so fucking good in this movie. It really must be said that Willem Dafoe is, like, one of the greatest actors of our time. Like, I'm sure everyone agrees with that, but, like, it's rare you ever hear someone say it. Dafoe is one of the greatest working actors. I love Willem Dafoe, and he is amazing in this movie. I love everything about The Northman, man. Super fun, super enjoyable movie. Uh, very stylish, very e exciting, very high energy. A whole lot of fun. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Now, I want to be clear. I watched this one in theaters, and it may not play on the small screen quite as well as it did on the big screen. But, I mean, I'm sure you can still enjoy it if you watch it on, on your TV. I mean, TVs are, like, getting better and cooler today. Don't watch it on your phone. Don't watch it on your fucking phone. Um... Watch it on, like, a big TV, you know? And, and uh, here it is, Barbarian. I... Does Barbarian belong above the menu? Hmm. I might rearrange that. I might rearrange that in editing. Like, who fucking knows? Maybe I'll fucking edit this. Maybe you're seeing this before I talk about the menu. If that happened, just know uh, I edited this one lower. But, I mean, I still love Barbarian. Like, pfft. Even if I decide to put the menu higher, which I might, which I might, uh, just know I still love Barbarian. I love Barbarian so much. I have long bemoaned how clean and sterile, like, horror movies have gotten. And part of it, I think, is the switch to digital. We're not shooting on film anymore, and that kind of gets rid of some of the grime of the 80s movies. But even then, like... I don't even think it's a bad thing in a lot of movies cases. I, I think a movie like... I, I think something like Get Out or, or some of the stuff A24's been putting out sort of work better with, like, the, the cleaner, less grimy aesthetic. Barbarian is the first filthy horror movie I have seen in a while. It is the first horror movie I have seen in a while that, like, really captures that grime that I have been missing from old horror movies. Like, even even X. X is like a grimy movie. It's a dirty movie. But I, I still feel like it falls short of, like, where those old horror movies were. And I think Barbarian really hits. It really scratches that itch I've been having for, like, old-school filthy horror. And, and on top of that, it's not just, like... A really creepy, really grimy, dirty horror movie. It's not just a thoroughly fucked up, enjoyable film. It is also, like, a kind of smart film. It's a film about, like, the damage Reaganomics has done and is still doing to this country. So, <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Like, it's, it's both a very good movie... Like, a very entertaining movie. It appeals to my tastes. And it's a pretty smart movie. It has something to say about, like, you know, uh, America, society, the like, the way things have gone downhill since the 80s. Uh, I, it's, it's a smart movie, I think. Um, you don't really get that for, like, the first half hour. Weirdly, this is a movie that, like, it takes a while to get into the horror, and typically I hate that, but in this movie it works, because very early on you get the sense that, like, something is not right here, and you're just waiting to find out what it is, and, like, the longer the movie can string you along, the longer you're like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck fuck, come on, come on, just telling us, telling us what it is is going to be better. It's, it's going to be less painful than just waiting for it. So it's the rare example of a movie that, like, does slowness well. A rare horror movie that manages to be slow but still be suspenseful that entire time. 
granted, once it finally gets into it, it's like a thoroughly disgusting, fucked up thing. And I, I love that about it as well. But, I don't know, just like everything about Barbarian, I think, kind of works. This is like a horror movie I feel like I have been waiting to see for a while. And I'm, I'm glad it's finally out there. <laughs> Fucking, uh... <laughs> Justin Long shows up in this movie, um, and he's, he's, like, kind of gotten old. It's been a little while since I've seen Justin Long in anything. He's gotten old, and he has aged into looking like my Uncle Dan. <laughs> like, he just kind of looks like my uncle now. Granted, my uncle has gotten older as well. He looks like my uncle did about ten years ago. But he looks like my uncle, which is kind of weird. <laughs> I love him in this movie. He's he is great in this movie. He's like he he's like this Hollywood writer actor who's like getting canceled. Not even getting canceled, getting you know, Weinstein, I suppose. I that's what we'll call it. He's he, he has been accused of some very unkind things. Um I heard someone say he's supposed to be a stand-in for, like, Max Landis. I buy that. I buy that he's supposed to be Max Landis. But I, ju I just love Justin Long in this movie. <laughs> he's just... He, he's a good performance, entertaining character. And uh, where they go with him, I think, really works. So that's... Uh, that's a movie I personally enjoy. Not everyone will be into this one. It is not... It is a little gross for, I think, a lot of mainstream audiences. But me personally, I loved it. If you can handle how sick this movie gets, by all means, this one's great. The Menu. Holy shit, I love The Menu. This is such a good movie. Good year for rich people trapped on an island where things blow up. Also, this movie is just... Abs it's like I, I was trying to describe it to uh, Mitzi and they, they're like oh so it's like a horror movie and I'm like not really I mean there are moments of suspense in it but I don't know what else I would call it I guess in the end I would honestly call the menu a comedy more than anything else <laughs> a very dark comedy this is like straight black comedy <laughs> but it's funny. It's so fucking funny. It's a really funny movie. Just this this chef who has gone like completely nuts and decides he he wants to kill this entire room full of rich people and and Anya Taylor-Joy who's like not really part of the guest list trying to navigate all this. There's just, there's so much, there's so many funny moments in this film. It is a very funny movie. It makes me laugh a whole lot. <laughs> in spite of how fucking dark it is, it is a dark movie. It is very fucked up. Let me be clear about that. <laughs> like, honestly, it's it's like no surprise that I loved this movie. I love this type of dark comedy shit. This is right up my fucking alley this was a good year for me there are a lot of movies that came out this year that i feel like are appealing to me specifically uh Wendell and wild x the northman babylon this there's even one more here on this list i have to mention that i i think i will enjoy a lot more than most people the, although the menu most people seem to be enjoying i am not at all alone on this I, most people are appreciating the menu it just, it's the type of thing that I would enjoy regardless. Like, even if other people were shit-talking this movie, I'd still be like, nope, I loved it. I mean, not everyone is loving Babylon. Babylon is getting pretty mixed reviews, uh, and I loved it. Weirdly, it feels like lately, like, critical consensus is less of a thing than it usually is. Not that there aren't still movies, like The Menu, for example, that get a lot of critical praise, like, from everyone, but it also feels like this year there were a lot more movies that just got mixed reviews. And it, it sort of went both ways. There were, like, 
I mean, even, like, like critics who I'm used to, like, agreeing with each other, I think had wildly varied takes on a lot of movies that came out this year, which is, is kind of weird, I think. Uh, kind of kind of interesting direction we're going here. I mean, every now and then you still get a movie like The Menu that just everyone universally loves. And rightfully so. It's a hilarious movie. And I realize now I have not said a whole lot about it, but... I don't really want to say a whole lot about it because I kind of just want you to go into this one blind. Uh, don't don't look up too much about the movie. Just go jump right into it because every single reveal in this movie is like good. It's all every single reveal is amazing. I love this movie. <laughs> some of them are funny, some of them are shocking. Uh some of them are funny and shocking. Um, so, please, by all means, please watch The Menu. Such a good fucking movie. Uh, highest recommendations for The Menu. Above that, we got The Whale. Um, <laughs> I, mm, The Whale has been getting a lot of praise. I, it might still be a hot take to put it this high. <laughs> but, here's the thing. I fucking love Darren Aronofsky. I am, like, such a fucking... I am so far up my own ass, I enjoy Noah. I think Noah is a good movie. That's how much I like Aronofsky stuff. And The Whale, I think, is a lot, a lot better than Noah. So, although, granted, it's based on, like, a play. And I, I could kind of tell while watching it, I'm like, this would be, like, an interesting play. Because it all kind of takes place in this one room. You could do a stage adaptation of this. Yeah, it's based on a play. It, it, it's not a play Aronofsky wrote. It's, it's something he's borrowing from someone else. But I still feel like there's a lot of Aronofsky to it. It is one of his more accessible films. Uh, I would say that it's, it's not quite to The Wrestler. The Wrestler is, like, easily his most accessible film. It's weird that The Wrestler is an Aronofsky movie. Because most of his stuff is this, like, really, like, out there, abstract, obtuse stuff. The Whale is not that. The Whale is very grounded. But it's also, like, kind of a misery movie. Like, that's the biggest complaint I have seen people give this movie, is it's just misery porn. It's just, like, miserable characters being miserable. And I don't totally agree with that. I do agree with my friend Michael, who said of this film that, like, a lot of it is just arguing scenes. And they're good arguing scenes. It makes sense that there's this much arguing, but, like... There's not a lot of build-up to it. It seems like the build-up has occurred before the movie. And now we're just getting, like, the meltdown, right? We're getting, like, the, the thing that has caused the meltdown has happened. It has occurred. And now the meltdown has started. And we're just arguing. And, like, a lot of the movie is just argument after argument after argument after argument. And I think all of them are great. And I think... Ultimately, the final product is very good, but I won't disagree that it is a lot of arguing scenes and it might be a little much for some people. I, I totally understand anyone who's like, oh my god, this is so... why is everyone so miserable? This is such a miserable movie. Also, another Aronofsky thing, there is like a lot of reference to religion and it tends to be, like, very nebulous. It doesn't really come down hard on one side or the other. Granted, it is very... It is very against... I mean, for one thing, it's sort of against these, like... MLM churches that, like... Are, are, are so prevalent nowadays. Like, those specifically, it's very against. Uh, also, and also, it's very against, like the homophobia that is rampant in Christianity, but it doesn't... There are a lot of characters in this movie with a lot of different opinions on religion, and it doesn't really pick one or the other to be like, oh, th this is the person that is right, or this is the person that is right. Really, I think it's like... It, it, I think it's very honest in its depiction of religion because a lot of it, a lot of, like, these characters' opinions on religion are built out of, like, their life, right? It's, it's not, 
is is like these are not beliefs that they just that just have come out of nowhere. It's people have like things have happened to these people in their lives that have led them to where they are now religiously and that i think is very interesting to see aronofsky is just one of those guys that like i i never mind him talking about religion in his movies i love when he's talking about religion in his movies and that i think is a rare thing for me to just look at a director and go like you you can talk about religion as much as you fucking want right aronofsky can talk about religion as much as he wants uh ken russell can talk about religion as much as he wants um, Hodorowski can talk about religion as much as he wants. That might be it. I, I, I feel like I'm forgetting someone, but I feel like those three, those three can talk about religion as much as they fucking want. <laughs> I, I am always down to hear about it. And I haven't even addressed, like, <laughs> the whale in the room, Mr. Brendan Fraser, uh, making his return to Hollywood after so long, and, like, genuinely genuinely he gives a great performance genuinely i think he deserves best actor for this film that is not me saying that because of like wholesome keanu reddit chungus oh yeah our boy brendan fraser is winning the oscar now listen i think it would be very cool and very wholesome for brendan fraser to win the oscar I also genuinely think he deserves it. He does a great job in this movie. I really hope he wins Best Actor. I am rooting for Brendan Fraser this year at the Oscars. And honestly, it's, it's not even like one of those cases where I'm like, I want this person to win or, or I want this movie to win. But clearly it's not. We'll get to that in a second. But like, I genuinely think Brendan Fraser has a chance. I'm going to be very upset if he does not win. Not that I dislike some of the other performers in the category. I'm just like, it's like, he did a great job. He deserves it purely based on how good his performance is alone. Plus, it would be a very wholesome, very happy return for Brendan Fraser to the industry. It's like, it's dual layered. I, I want him to get it because he deserves it. But if he gets it, there's, like, uh, the added bonus of, like, yeah, it's really cool that Brendan Fraser was able to come back and win the Oscar. I, I, you love to see it. I say that, I, I said very similar things last year about Will Smith, and then he fucking ruined that. So, Brendan, uh, please don't get up and smack anyone in the middle of the, the, the show. Please. Please be nice. I'm not opening another one. I have one more movie to talk about. Everything, everywhere, all at once. I, I kind of hate that this is my favorite movie of the year. Because, <laughs> like, this, this has been praised to no end. And, like, I can feel, like, you know, the deliberately, uh, the deliberately contrarian people out there going, like, Oh, it's not as good as everyone says. They're they're gonna, the people who are just gonna hate on this movie because everyone loves it. You know, you know they're out there. But I think it speaks to how great this movie is that like I haven't heard a lot of that. Like, what little negative stuff I have heard about everything, everywhere, all at once. I have had to seek out on my own. Granted. I saw this in a theater with six people, and three of them got up and left by the end. But, uh, two of them were, like, an old couple who, like, clearly did not understand what was going on in the movie. And about the time people started shoving stuff up their ass, they're like, okay, we're out of here. And, like, fair. This is not a movie for old people. Not everyone is going to enjoy this. But I feel like... Everyone my age is going to enjoy this. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I have seen generation-defining films before. I don't know if I've ever seen a generation-defining film for my generation until now. Maybe Dark Knight. Maybe Dark Knight you could call generation-defining. But everything, everywhere, all at once just feels like the culmination of the last 20 years of pop culture, right? This is what it's all been leading to. This is the ultimate form of, like, everything we have grown up on, everything we have been following for the last 
two decades, for like our entire lives, right? This feels generation defining to me. That is how I would describe everything everywhere all at once. And you can say you didn't enjoy it. You can say it like wasn't as good a movie as you were expecting. You can even say like it was very good, it just wasn't the best film of the year. Fine. I think it's generation defining. And I think that that is not why it has taken the top spot. You can be generation defining and still not be the best movie of the year. It has taken the top spot because I genuinely loved this film. But that is just how I feel about it. It feels generation-defining to me. Uh, weirdly, Michael and I both saw this in theaters. We both gave it a 9 out of 10 when we saw it in theaters. And then Michael picked it for, like, uh, our movie nights that we do every week. And both of us, after re-watching it, went, Nah, this is a 10. This is a 10 out of 10 movie. And honestly, I would say it's like the first 10 out of 10, new, the first new 10 out of 10 movie I've seen since like, either Arrival or Get Out, I forget which one came out first, but Arrival and Get Out were, would be like the most recent films I've given a 10 out of 10 to, and this, this is the new 10 out of 10 that I have at, at last awarded. I have finally given another movie a 10 out of 10. I mean, granted, there have been movies in between there that I have seen that I've given a 10 out of 10 to. They're just all old movies, right? Like, I also, in 2022, gave a 10 out of 10 to the Woodstock documentary. But that came out in 1970, so, like, th that's not a new movie. As far as, like, new movies go, this is the first 10 out of 10 since, like, 2017. I, I fucking love everything everywhere all at once. It's such... Like, it's... <laughs> It is everything you want in a movie. It does everything you'd want a movie to do. Like, no matter no matter your tastes, it feels like there is probably going to be something in this movie for you. It feels like it would be hard to watch this movie and not enjoy at least something about it. I love it. I love it so much. And I love that it has become as highly praised as it has, even if I know that's going to bring with it naysayers and people who, who who are going to be mean to the film just because everyone else loves it. And I am even because it feels like I'm going for the normie pick with this one. Uh, I'm okay going with the normie pick if it's this fucking good. I loved this movie. This movie is great. Now, a lot of people are saying this is a contender for best picture. A lot of people are hopeful that this will win best picture. And I'm not saying it can't win Best Picture, because Parasite won a few years ago, and that was a surprise. That was a rare W for the Oscars. I have my doubts. I have my doubts this is going to win Best Picture, only because, A, it is fun, and the Academy hates fun, and B, it's sci-fi, and in the 95 years the Academy has been running, a sci-fi movie has not once won Best Picture, which definitely speaks to the Academy's biases. Like, how the fuck can you go 95 years and not give Best Picture to a sci-fi film even once? Horror at least has Silence of the Lambs. It's underrepresented. There needs to be more than just Silence of the Lambs. But at least horror has Silence of the Lambs. At least action has... Well, okay. Action has Gladiator. They gotta take Gladiator. But it also... There's The French Connection. The French Connection is a great action movie. And I'm glad it won Best Picture. <laughs> it's weird that there have only been two action movies to ever take Best Picture. The Academy sucks with genre films, is what I'm saying. And this is very much a genre film, and that makes me doubt that it is going to win. If it wins, full points to the Oscars. The Oscars can have a W. I have my doubts. That was too long. I spent too long doing this, but you know what? Fuck it. Uh, there's two and a half hours of me talking about... Oh god, I'm gonna have to edit this too. Oh god, two and a half hours of me talking about the movies of 2021. Actually, it's an hour 40 at this point, but probably the final product will be like an hour 30, maybe like an hour 20 even, after I edit it all down. <sighs> a good year. Good year for movies, I think. I, I, I feel like uh, Hollywood has kind of gotten back on their feet after... 
2020. <laughs> Solid year for movies. I, th I think we got a lot of good stuff this year, and I am very hopeful for the future of film. Yeah. Cheers to a new year. I know I've already put out two videos this year, but they're the Jimmy Neutron videos. And I started those, like, way back last year. So, this is my New Year video, right? I'm in the new apartment. Granted, after this, Jimmy Neutron Part 3 is going to come out and it's going to be at the old apartment again. But after that, well, wait, no, then there's another Jimmy <laughs> There's two more Jimmy Neutron videos. After that, we'll get to new stuff. I promise. Uh, thank you for joining me. Have a nice day.